It's one of the most prestigious roles in acting. The, the movie world's most, most famous secret agent. Today it was announced. That... After months of speculation, the coveted job of being the next 007. Finally been been unmasked. And his name is Craig. Daniel Craig. Craig. Daniel Craig. Craig. Daniel Craig. Hundreds of actors were considered before he was chosen to play 007. He beat off stiff competition from a host of stars, including Clive Owen, Hugh Jackman and Colin Farrell. I'll show you the 37-year-old actor is the first blonde Bond. Blonde Bond. Are we ready for the first blonde Bond? He is extraordinarily different from what we've had before. He's got a few more lines around the face. It does look a little bit moodier and, frankly, in the press conference, he wasn't really that forthcoming. A somewhat lacklustre press conference. Reporters were distinctly underwhelmed by 007's official unveiling today. Knives out already for the new James Bond. Fierce criticism, James Bland is, is how the mirror describes it. hasn't even started the role, has he? But they're being a bit harsh in the paper, so we'd quite like to have your texts and emails and phone calls on that as well. The Mirror says this morning that the new Bond, Daniel Craig, lacks the charm and the charisma needed by 007. I must admit, he doesn't exactly look the part, but he might grow into the job. Good evening. I always felt about Daniel, because I had seen a lot of things from our friends from the North, and then obviously Enduring Love and my mother. And I always felt like whenever he was on the screen, you couldn't watch anyone else. You'd be interested in the scene stuff, but he just, he's lit from within. And I remember the thing that really set me, and I went, it has to be him, it was years before anything, was in Elizabeth, him walking down the corridor. And it was just like, that is the most charismatic person I've ever seen on the screen. So it was clear that he's a movie star and a great actor to boot. Now, I think to put it in perspective, at this time in Daniel's career, he wasn't thought of as a leading man. It was not what people thought of. They thought he was a great supporting actor. And Barbara and I could see that he was actually a leading man. I had a career. I mean, as far as I was concerned, I had a really successful career. More successful than I ever thought I would be as an actor. But I didn't have a cool persona. You know, Pierce had done Remington Steele. Um, Roger had done uh, the, the, the Saint. It's like, they'd done these parts where people were going, oh, that's James. I mean, you know, I'd done weird arty movies. You know, it was a harder sell. It's like, I don't do many suave and sophisticated roles. I hadn't done any. And I didn't really want to do it because I thought I wouldn't know what to do with it. Rehearsal, quiet. Action. Michael and I really wanted him. We only wanted him. The only problem was that he didn't want to do it. Um, <laughs> the small detail, yes. And you came into the office, and I remember he walked in, and I said to Michael afterwards, he wants to do it. It was the funniest thing. It was something about the way he had his, he had, was wearing French cuffs and they weren't done up. And I, I just, just that thing somehow, I don't know why it was. I said, he wants to do it. And Michael's going, you, you think so? I said, yes, he does, he does. And we were just determined to have him. Action. And the money. Every penny of it. Treasury has agreed to stake you in the game. Vespa. I do hope you gave your parents help with that. It was like there wasn't anyone else. That kept freaking the studio out because we kept saying there is no one else. We don't want anyone else. And they kept trying to get us to meet people.
I suppose all of these sort of like hurdles, what I was saying to myself, it's all right, what's going to happen is I'm going to get the script, I'm going to read it, I'm going to go, no, thanks very much, it's really nice. Because it's just like, I mean, ultimately, that's kind of all an actor can do, really, is be kind of like, go, you know, you read the script and you go, I don't like the script, sorry. Little did I know. <laughs> that happens every time. Yeah, yeah. It? <laughs> but it was Casino Royale. The story was solid, the script was really solid, and it was just like, I didn't, Imagine the scope of it. I didn't imagine all the, like the crane sequence and all of those sequences. I had no idea about any of that, but I knew the story stuck together. You know, it just it flew. I remember calling you to tell you got the job. Yeah. I went. I went. Yes. She just went over to you, kiddo. <laughs> <laughs> so I went down and I just grabbed a bottle of vodka and some vermouth and bought a cocktail shaker and went back to my apartment and started mixing myself vodka martinis. You know, that's not half bad. That was the first bit of training. <laughs> that was my first bit of exercise. I think I had a hangover for like three days. <laughs> and then I sent Simon Waterston. Yeah, who's my trainer, yeah. And I literally met him with a rolly and a, a bacon sandwich. That's his first memory of me. I was like literally smoking a cigarette and eating a bacon sandwich. I just said to him, I said, I want to change. And he went, OK. So we did. Um, and it was seven days a week from then on in. The way you went into physical training for it, I've never seen any actor do anything like that, completely change your physique. He said, I have to look like I'm, like I could do the role. I mean, it's kind of amazing. And he trained like an Olympic athlete. It was just fantastic. Now, after months of speculation, the new James Bond has finally been unmasked. And his name is Craig, Daniel Craig. Today, it was announced that Brit actor Daniel Craig had beaten hundreds of competitors to grab the role. But after four decades of tall, dark and handsome, are we really ready for the first blonde Bond? They're saying they wanted him to... Well, you always get press on Bond. You get so much attention. But the lead-up was just absolutely a roller coaster. You have to say, it does appear to be casting against type. To put it kindly, it's a bit rough around the edges. I remember when we did the announcement with you going down the Thames, and already it started because we had the Marines, and they said he had to wear a, a life jacket. And we said, OK, well, he has to. And then, you know, it started then. Oh, Bond, you know, wearing a life jacket, how ridiculous. And then I was grumpy in the press conference. <laughs> no, you're never grumpy. It was like someone asked a question, I think, that's a stupid question. And by the way I dealt with it was just to be kind of bristly. I'm not going to go into it. Yes. Sorry. But um, when the onslaught of press against him happened on Casino Royale, it was brutal. I mean, it was way beyond any... And it was because of what? You know, blonde bond? Like, no, it's blonde. Very, very hurt. You know, wasn't Roger Moore blonde? I mean, it, it was so irrational. They hadn't seen him in the role. It's just, it was very, very distressing when he was, I remember we were in the Bahamas and he was on that crane sequence and he was killing himself on that crane sequence. And, and we would all come back and then it'd be all over the news, all over the internet. And it's just so irresponsible that people were manufacturing this stuff based on what? Based on a couple of teenagers who had started a, an internet thing called Craig Not Bond. But, all these news agencies were treating it as if it was like real news, you know, like it's an opinion of a couple of kids who hadn't seen a foot of film that the man had shot. Someone said, you might want to go online. And there might be a bit of an issue. And I was like, what? I did, I went online. I went and stayed up all night and read everything because that's what happens if you do that. And it was, it was tough. It was really, really tough. It was hate-filled. And I woke up the following morning, and I went, fuck it. I know the film's going to be good. It was just horrible. The whole crew, we were all just brimming with anger about it and, and trying to act very <laughs> casual around him. But we were angry for him, because it was so unfair. Everybody else was in a, 
a state about it. Everybody else was in this going, God, oh my God, I'm so sorry. It must be awful. And I was like, it's fine. It's all good. Come on, let's crack on with it. Because I knew we were doing something really special. It's a tribute to Daniel that he could look past it. But a lot of people can't. And people, people work on the film. It affects the morale. Also, I remember going back to the horrendous time in the Bahamas. We, you know, we were besieged with paparazzi. I mean, they, one guy was like buried himself in the sand sort of the night bef before we were going to be on the beach. I mean, it was insane. It was like, you know, crazy. And I remember Daniel coming out of the water and the whole crew going, oh my God. And that was probably the only time when a pap shot, because it was a pap shot that broke, that then of course changed the whole idea of, you know, Daniel and what his bond was going to be like. Suddenly everybody went, oh my God, this is the guy, the blonde guy. Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> Look at those tits. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing changed. And then it was a whole different thing. Then he was suddenly the coolest guy on earth. These two gave me a voice. I mean, I asked for it. I mean, I spoke to both of you. I remember having this yeah. conversation. I said, if you're going to make, make me do this, I didn't say that. <laughs> I think you did. <laughs> but it was being allowed to discuss it. You know, Martin and I, we argued a lot on, on it. He didn't get, he, he never got upset with me. He got, you know, we used to have kind of, you know, these kind of occasionally pitch battles on set. They were, they were never angry. They were just like, I don't agree with you. I don't agree with you. And, but somehow it elevated it. It was allowing me to see if I saw something that I didn't think was right, I would go and discuss it. And if I was wrong, I'd go, OK, oh, fair enough, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But if I felt I was right, I felt like I had the power to be able to go, I know I'm right about this. And there's a couple of scenes in the movie which I'm really glad I, I spoke up about, and they work. But Martin let me do that. The shower scene, which is, I think, one of the most beautiful scenes ever in a movie. You know, after that, that fight in the hallway, and in the script, it was written that that uh, Ava Green was in her underwear, and you were in the, you know, and Daniel said, "No, they they don't get undressed. They're in their clothes." And I just remember that day. Oh my God! It's like this blood. It was there in the script, but it was just, it was sort of hinted at in the script. And I just was all about this thing about, if we're going to go with the violence, and we're going to go with the reality of it, then, you know, it's still, it's still a James Bond movie. But the fact of it is, I wanted to see what happens, the effect it has on people. And I was like, she's in shock. So she's sitting in the shower in her clothes. It made complete sense to me. I remember talking to the composer and saying, that's the moment they fall in love. Mm. And the music in that scene is just so beautiful, David Arnold. Mm. The thing that Daniel brought to the character in the series was Bond's inner life and the emotional life and the complexity of the emotional life, which was in the books, but never really translated onto the screen until he came on. And we were ready to make a shift because we were getting too fantastical in our series. And Daniel's an actor who can bring it down to where it belongs, make it more real, make it more emotionally connected, make it more dramatic. And we wanted to make that change. So we needed him to do it because we couldn't do it with anybody else. Barbara and Michael wanted to do something, change it for a reason. They wanted to 
to turn it on its head. And I was like, I'm up for that. I'll, I, if, you're, if that's what you want to do, I'm up for that. Walk a martini. Shaken or stirred? Do I look like I give a damn? A lot of the kind of the cliches, as it were, that have become cliches over the years because they've become Bond tropes, I was like, we can't really do that. We have to try and th reinvent it. But saying that, he's really, really difficult to write for. Putting words in, in James Bond's mouth. Because all that anybody remembers are the one-liners. You know, for me, the funniest lines are out of reality. The greatest Bond lines are stress release. They're like, they're a release of, you know, of, of tension so that you go, oh, God, you know, because it's he's in a terrible situation. and. You have to create that. You have to create the tension and then have the one-liner. You can't just... The one-liner is not the scene. I've got a little itch down there. Would you mind? Man, Mr. Bond. Ah! Yeah! Ah! Ah! Mm. Well, the yeah. same with Bond, yeah. James Bond. Exactly. I mean, I know Pierce, everybody. I mean, Pierce talks about it, but it's like, you know, saying that fucking line. I mean, if I have to say it, I'll say it once to myself. And then you're on set and you think, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then you say it, and it's like this the weight of it. And I think I'm kind of quite, I try and be quite cool about these things, but it's impossible. I mean, I don't know how many takes we did at the end of Casino Royale, but literally there are takes with the name's Bond, James Bond. <laughs> it's like, it's like I'm a 13 year old whose voice is breaking. The name's Bond, James Bond. The film was good, but because people's expectations where let's go and see this train wreck i mean i think a lot of people did think i think they were going to go and see it for the kind of sh you know the shits and giggles factor of the fact that this is let's go and see let's go and see this one shot wonder <laughs> i mean all of that going on and it's like the response was i mean you know i remember being at the premiere which was leicester square mm -hmm. that was just like i mean what i was like what is going on and the credits came up. I mean, the, the pre-title sequence. And it's not the biggest pre-title sequence because it's just fight in the bathroom, isn't it? That's all it is. Black it's like, it's black and white, and it's not that particularly long. It's not particularly ambitious like that. And it came to the end, of it, and, the, and the music came in, and everybody, you, I mean, everybody started cheering. And it was just like, you know, I'm kind of filling up about it now. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it just went skyrocketed. The movie went crazy. And the reviews were crazy, right? They the were. reviews were great. And the numbers were great. Although, I think all that bad publicity, we could have done better without it. I think we could. I think we could have done a lot better. But we were good. Solid success. Mr. Daniel Craig, Daniel Craig proved all his doubters wrong with his debut in Casino Royale. The most successful yet. The highest grossing Bond movie in history. Box office hit Casino Royale becomes the first ever in the series to be shown in China's cinemas. The super spy has finally conquered the communists. He really has completely re-energized this franchise. Congratulations. You know, I think the celebration's in order. On Quantum, however, no. <laughs> uh, we had a writer's strike. We had a, a, a script. It wasn't completed, but it was nearly completed, and we had a writer's strike. I mean, the movie kind of works. It's not Casino Royale, and that was always going to be... It was like literally troubling second album syndrome. In a way, we could not top Casino. It's easy to say that. Of course, we wanted to top Casino, but, but you know... We were up against the writer's strike on one end. Which was, we, everybody knew was coming. We knew was coming, and we hadn't quite gotten the script right. We didn't have a director yet. And on the other end was the, there was supposed to be an actor's strike, a SAG strike. So we were like, if we don't go now, it's going to be Never Never Land. So we basically started shooting without a script, which is never a good idea. 
But the script was turned in, and I remember the, the writer who turned the script in and then picked up his check and then picked up his, his placard and stood outside the studio striking. <laughs> Anyway, so we were kind of screwed, and we had to all kind of muddle in and try and make the story work, and it wasn't really working that great. But, you know, I look back at the movie, and, you know, it's still a good movie. There's some really special moments in that film. Yeah. Very special. I don't know if it, the movie adheres together as well as it should, but that was just because of the story was, it wasn't solid. We just didn't get Bond's journey right in it, uh, which is the key. It wasn't totally focused on his journey. And I think sometimes we get, we can get too wound up in plot rather than keep to the story, which is an issue for these kind of films. What had happened, weirdly, and it's not nobody's fault, I mean, it's my fault mainly, is that, you know, the stunt guys were like, oh, God, you can do this. So I'd get more and more and more to do. I was loving it. It was great. I was jumping all over the place. So I threw myself into the stunts more than I threw myself, because I, I, the script was a bit kind of like, I don't know what to do about the script. I can't, I, I'm not a writer. I can't help. And even though Mark and I would sit and we'd try and bash things out, I couldn't really help. So I threw myself into stunts, and I basically volunteered for every single stunt in the movie. And that was, with hindsight, it was a bad mistake because I got badly hurt. But on Quantum, I think I was sort of overwhelmed. My world had turned upside down. I mean, upside down. My personal life was affected by being fa that famous all of a sudden. I can honestly say I was sort of in a bit cloud cuckoo land. When you think about it, I mean, Daniel went from not being a household name to being on the tea towels, literally on the tea towels. That's a huge transformation for someone. And I mean, I remember you were sort of under siege at, at a point, weren't you? I mean, I think I was physically under siege, but also I was mentally under siege. I mean, you know, when there are people in trees outside your house, you're kind of, you know, I mean, they say, you know, what have you got to be paranoid about? I mean, I didn't go out. I mean, I literally kind of would lock myself in and close the curtains because I didn't know how to handle it. And I don't still. I mean, there were times I was worried for him because he wasn't enjoying life. You know, it felt like it was really a big sacrifice. And then we did a play together in New York. Yeah. I think that... And you, Chapman, <laughs> taught me a few things. Yeah, I mean, that was interesting because... Well, one of the things that Hugh taught me was that I, I'm not Hugh. Yeah. Because Hugh's extraordinary. I mean, his wife calls him Senator Jackman. So, you know, it's like, <laughs> so he goes out, you know, like he waves to the crowd and talks to everybody, kisses every baby. <laughs> like that. I mean, it's like there for hours every night after the show. And I kind of, and I didn't, I joined in. I kind of was like, okay. I mean, they were, you know, because they were there to see us both. I mean, it's like, and they were both, and they were excited to see us both. And it was, so I think that broke a big, it, it, it's the enjoyment. It broke a boil. It, I yeah, think. it broke a boil, exactly. It kind of, it just made it that, you know what? It ain't that bad. It became fun. It became fun. Where the hell have you been? You didn't get the postcard? You should try it sometime. Get away from it all. It really lends perspective. When we got to Skyfall, it was about building the family again, the MI6 yes. family, yeah. because we knew that Judy would be departing. And getting Rafe um, involved. And getting it, Rafe involved. Yeah, yeah. And Ben. And you know, Ben and, like and Naomi and Harris. Yeah. So we yeah. felt we were betting into something again and giving Bond his family, his foundation back. And it was like, we have to have a, a new cue. And, you know, uh, Ben, the casting of Ben was just like this genius thing. It just pleased everybody. It always makes me feel a little melancholy. A grand old warship being ignominiously hauled away for scrap. <laughs> the inevitability of time, don't you think? 
What do you see? A bloody big ship. Excuse me. 007. I'm your new quartermaster. You must be joking. Why? Because I'm not wearing a lab coat? Because you still have spots. I got very excited when I saw my friend Daniel play James Bond in Casino Royale, and I thought it opened up all sorts of wonderful possibilities for the character. And I wanted a huge challenge, and for me, this was an enormous challenge. Daniel had suggested Sam, which was a really great idea. And, you know, Sam was coming back to England, and he'd never done anything on that sort of scale before. And it was a great combination. Yeah, you know, Sam came in, and. He loves actors and he loves directing actors. And we had a great story and all the actors came up and turned up. They created something. They reinvented it. They, they did it in a way that's incredibly memorable, I think. Are you sure this is about M? It's about her. And you and me. You see, we are the last two rats. We can either eat each other Mm -hmm. Or eat everyone else. How you're trying to remember your training now? What's the regulation to cover this? Well, first time for everything, yes. Hmm. What makes you think this is my first time? Oh, Mr. Bond. That scene with you and Javier, when the sort of sexual innuendo between the two of you, and you say, what makes you think this is my first time? I mean, I remember we were told to cut that line by the studio, and we said, no, no, no. We resisted, we resisted. And I remember the night of the premiere, that line, just the whole place erupted them with that line. I remember looking at the studio executive who was in the next thing and going, see, told you. No, we, have, we have the poster, by the way. Yeah. Skyfall is an example, again, of a complex story and a very simple plot. And those emotional stories really work. And both Casino Royale and Skyfall demonstrate that. And we had an ending. You know, we had an ending for Skyfall. We'd figured the ending out very early on. It was emotionally very emotionally affecting. I suppose it's too late to make a run for it. Well, I'm game if you are. Right. The day that we filmed her death was was very emotional. I mean, it's uh, it was it was difficult. I mean, we joked most of the day, but it was actually it was a, it was very tough to do because she's been part of Bond for a while, and it's like she has something about her, and 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 it comes across in her acting, and it comes across in everything she does. Uh, it was an extremely emotional day for all of us. Um, I think for Judy, who was really holding it together. Um, but, you know, for me also, because during the sort of 17 years that we've been working together, you know, we've all been through a lot. And um, she's reinvented this character. And it was pretty devastating. We were, all, we were all a mess. Well, I was a mess, particularly. I mean, on a purely personal level, the fact that I got to act with Judi Dench was a lifelong ambition. The fact that I got to act as Judi Dench being my M is just beyond the realms.
Skyfall for me was a culmination of, it was every, it, it kind of ticked all my boxes. <laughs> with so many things about Skyfall that were terrific. The story and then bringing the family together and the really emotional ending and all that. But then we also had Adele and we also had the Olympics. And that was just incredible. stars of the new James Bond movie, Skyfall, are with us. Yes, they are. <laughs> Daniel Craig is here. The last time we saw you as Bond, uh, with Her Majesty, the Olympics, mm -hmm. how long was that in the planning? Quite a long time. Uh, Danny Boyle came to visit me on set. Um, he sat me down, he told me what he wanted to do, and I walked out and said, what was that? <laughs> 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 I really thought he was just pulling my leg. So, um, anyway, the whole kind of thing, um, you know, came about. Next thing I know, I'm at the palace. Because you must have thought, oh, I'll agree to it, but it'll never happen. You know, you can say... Well, I didn't. I mean, I thought they hadn't sort of had the OK from the palace, but apparently they got that first and then asked me, so I didn't have much choice. Oh, yeah. Would, imagine if you turned it down. We <laughs> <laughs> gasp all the way around the stadium. James Bond epic. Starring Daniel Craig and Her Majesty the Queen. The British Artist of the Year Award was created in 2006, and the first recipient was another incredibly talented actor, Rachel Weisz, Daniel's wife. The Tenure Award, the best British... Sorry, I'll get it together on the day. Best British... The British artist. Bri <laughs> artist. Daniel. Artist. And now, six years later, with Rachel's patient tutelage <laughs> and coaching he is in the position to be able to accept about 11 people got off of the role before him but don't uh, don't put any of this Clooney I think was first Clooney I got off it um I think even yeah Jude Law got off it Will Farrell got off it the hands together for the British artist of the year Mr Daniel Craig Thank you, BAFTA, for this. It's incredibly humbling to receive this honor with all these amazingly talented people. Michael Wilson and Barbara Broccoli, together with Cubby Broccoli, they made a franchise last 50 years, and uh, they allowed me to be part of it. So thank you. Thank you. We had to convince Sam to do it. I mean, you know, Sam was very much in two minds about it. He felt he'd done it, and he'd done it so successfully to drag him back in. But he got into it. He approached this whole series with tremendous enthusiasm, mm. I would say. Go. You know, let's get the car in. Let's do the biggest explosion. He just really embraced all the tropes, which was, it was time for that to happen. And, uh, and it was fun. Yeah, I always wanted to have the gadgets and things back in the movie. It was just bringing them back in in an original way. And I think Sam and I's conversation before Spectre was, how do we make it kind of so it, it feels fresh? But I think we needed to find a big hook to the story. And then obviously what came up was the idea of bringing Blofeld back. Welcome, James. It's been a long time. Finally, here we are. What took you so long? Cuckoo. I had a lot of fun on that movie, but part of the problem was that movie, I broke my leg. And we had a, we had a choice. We could shut down for nine months, and I could go and get an operation, or I could, I could crack on with the movie. And I didn't want to shut down for nine months. 
I, I thought I've got to finish the movie, so I wore basically a, a bionic leg for the rest of the rest of the film, which was not the greatest way to do a Bond movie. And you didn't stop doing all the action. No, and it, you know, unfortunately, it was in massively distracting for me. So I, I, I probably was talking through my ass when I said it was the best experience of my life because I was trying to juggle an awful lot of things. I had to psychologically juggle my physical state. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Mark. The trouble is with the injury I had, the leg would give way, and I, <laughs> which is kind of great when you watch me walking at the beginning of the movie, and I climb out of a window, walk down a ledge, and jump down another ledge, and jump down another ledge. I'm literally going, don't give way, don't give way, don't give way. I mean, I'm t I've got a wire on, but I'm, I mean, it's, it's very traumatic. I mean, so I'm trying to be cool, but my leg is, it's, it's shot. Was in excruciating pain and that whole sequence the opening sequence was redesigned for him to be more stealth like because you could barely walk i remember i was just looking at him and thinking i don't know how he's actually managing this i mean we had 1500 extras you know it was a massive massive sequence we'd shut down the square for four days and he was like i'm gonna do it you know but we changed the idea and i just said look we keep it mysterious. So basically, I'm doing a lot of entrances and exits. And I think that kind of worked. In a way, it was fortuitous, because that scene is exceptional. And if we'd shut down, God knows. I don't know. I don't we know. We never could have achieved it. Well, you know what? They said nine month recovery. I mean, it may be for a 22 year old athlete, but it's not for a, a man of <laughs> advancing years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to kind of go on about how hard Spectre was, but it was it was tough. And I needed a break. I needed to kind of switch off. I needed to get away. And, and I genuinely felt psychologically at the end of that film, maybe I'm just too old. And the problem is the way we started these films, I've started my tenure at this, was throwing myself at it like a bull in a china shop. So to sort of not do that seemed to be like, well, what's the point? That's, I mean, it, it just felt like completely wrong. I mean, I genuinely, I convinced myself that was it. Daniel Craig is definitely not doing another Bond movie. In a super candid interview with Time Out while doing press for Spectre, Daniel Craig is asked if he'd want to do another Bond movie. His answer, now I'd rather break this glass and slash my wrists. It was two days after I finished shooting the last movie. Sure. I went straight into an interview and someone said, would you do another one? Oh, okay. And I went, no, I, and I, instead of saying something, you know, um, <laughs> with style and, and grace, I gave a really stupid answer. Someone gave me a good analogy, which is that if you were asked 200 meters from the end of a marathon whether you'd run another marathon, you'd be, you know, you'd be fairly short and sweet about the answer, which is what I was. I've read that it'll be your last. Will this be your last? I don't know. The burning question, will it be your last one? Who knows? Are you going to stay? Are you going to go? Just I don't hammer know. It out? I just don't no? know. The honest answer is I don't know. I don't know. Daniel Craig. Will you return as James Bond? Yes. You know, Barbara drives a hard bargain. So I don't think I was ever really going to get away with leaving after Spectre. That was supposed to be his last movie, although I told him it wasn't going to be. It was supposed to be my last movie, but Barbara said no. <laughs> I said, there is unfinished business. We haven't told the rest of the story. There is still story to be told here. So we started this one with the idea that, wow, we got to go for broke. 
The production on the latest film, Bond 25, was reportedly just shut down. It's being reported that Craig injured himself in Jamaica on the set of Bond 25. We had the injury, but we also had, you know, we, we started with one director, we got another. And then we had script issues that went on and on and on. And it's also emotionally tough being Daniel's last one. It's tough on Barbara, it's tough on me, it's tough on Daniel especially. And, you know, it, you don't appreciate that. You don't appreciate how emotionally difficult it is to do these things. They're always a struggle, come on, it's always what it is. But this has been, it's been harder than most but because we were up against it so much. People were just like, we're gonna get it done. This is the last one, this is, and it felt like everybody just bought into it. I'm just so thrilled at how this film has turned out. There's something about this film that the culmination of the five films, and this film in particular, it makes me feel as if not only has he made his mark on the Bond franchise, but he has now made his mark in cinematic history. I mean, the night he completed the role and we wrapped the film was like a real moment. Mm -hmm. And the last shot was him running down an alley, disappearing out of shot. It was just unbelievable. It was a, a, a historic moment. Everyone came, it was, we were night shooting and everyone came down to kind of witness the moment because we knew how significant it was. It was deeply emotional. I mean, everyone was sobbing, literally sobbing. People wouldn't sobbing. leave. You know, usually on night shoot, everybody leaves. No, they just stood around and just embraced each other. You know, I, I've been doing this for a while, and there's some people I've actually worked with here, I think, most of my career, which is getting on for about 30 years, so that's quite a long time. Um, and a lot of people here worked on five pictures with me, and I know there's a lot of things said about what I think about these films and all of those, whatever, but I've loved every single second of these movies, and especially this one, because I've got up every morning and I've had the chance to work um, with you guys. And that has been one of the greatest honors of my life, so. I look at what I've done and go, that's part of Goldfinger. And I'm like, wow. I mean, I'm connected to Goldfinger. I'm connected to Dr. No. I'm connected to Live and Let Die. I mean, my tenure is what it is, but it's only part of something bigger. That's just, that's what it is. When you look back and go, I'm, I mean, genuinely, I feel like that. But I look at the films, and I'm incredibly proud of every single one of them. I know we've done our best. Yeah, for sure. I mean, really done our best. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, he's sitting here, so it's awkward to say it, but Daniel has just taken this, the character, the series, the whole thing to a place that is so extraordinary and so emotionally satisfying. That I cannot imagine Bond after Daniel. Let's be honest, leaving this role is not easy. It's a really difficult thing to do. And, you know, I can be as brazen and blase about it as I like. It's still tough to do. It's still tough to walk away from. And it's not about money and fame, because I've got it. I mean, I'm incredibly lucky. I'm incredibly fortunate to have to been able to do this. It's given me more things in my life than I could ever wish for. And it's not about any of those things. It's about a, a psychological connection to something that, that's taken up 15 years of my life. And to walk away from something like that is very, very tricky. But I think it's OK now. I do. And it's because we did this movie, really. 
I mean, I just think that it's all right now.